Okay, so we are at the Fairmont uh, Hotel in Toronto. Uh, we are about to interview, uh, for a second time, Carlos Diaz. The interviewer, as usual, will be William McRae. And the date is uh, August 25th, 2015. So, uh, Carlos, if you could just please state your full name. Okay, my full name is Carlos Diaz. And uh, I am uh, 83 years uh, old. Um, and uh, I was born in Chile. And, um, and uh, a, a very brief uh, summary of uh, my career um, uh, would uh, be as follows. Uh, uh, as a young graduate from the School of Engineering, uh, I was hired to uh, become uh, an assistant uh, professor at uh, the University of Chile in the field of uh, high temperature uh, process uh, metallurgy. Um, I had the opportunity to do graduate work, uh, graduate work in this field uh, at Columbia University first, uh, and then at the Imperial College. Uh, and um, um, I have to say that at that time, the Faculty of Physics and Mathematics of the University of Chile, mainly engineering, uh, was uh, undergoing uh, a, a major upgrading um, under the leadership of uh, uh, the rector of the university, who happened to be a historian. That's very important yeah. to mention. <laughs> and uh, and uh, uh, he thought that um, it was very important uh, uh, to make sure that the faculty was going to be able to develop uh, the engineers that the country would need uh, to leave uh, the third world uh, behind. Yes. Um, so, uh, the people of my generation um, uh, had the opportunity uh, to write a very important chapter in the development of the faculty. When, when, when I was a student at the University of Chile, um, there were probably not more than five full-time academics in the entire faculty. Um, and um, uh, when, when I moved to Canada in 1975, um, there were probably 150 wow. full-time academics. So you really saw the, uh, the boom of uh, Oh, absolutely. Academia. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and the key thing, uh, Will, was that um, um, our uh, involvement in what uh, was going on was like a hundred percent. And uh, my wife would tell me that uh, the university had become like a lover for me. <laughs> Spending too much time with the university, not enough with your wife. <laughs> and the children, and mm -hmm. the children. I, I practically didn't see my children growing. And I am happy that life gave me an opportunity to see this stage of development um, in my grandchildren. I'm very close to them uh, nowadays, and I spend a lot of time with these young people. Um, well, anyways, uh, uh, that would, uh, I would say in very general terms, in a nutshell, you know, a mm -hmm. summary of, uh, of a very important 
part of my life because I did uh, work as an academic at the University of Chile for 22, 23 years. And, uh, and um, I, I, I was head, I actually was asked to form, uh, and I was the first head of the Department of Chemistry in the faculty. Uh, then uh, I, uh, I was head of the Department of uh, Mining and Extracting Metallurgy, and uh, for a few years I was the director of the School of Engineering. Um, so when, when, when I came here, as I told Anna, uh, my knapsack was loaded with history mm -hmm. and my heart was bleeding <laughs> because I was leaving uh, behind uh, a period of my life uh, which had been my life. Yes, and something you had helped build as well. Right. Something you saw. Right, right. So anyways, uh, 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 the second stage of, of my career was my uh, 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 work at INCO. And, uh, and uh, I came to INCO, I had, well, I came to Canada, I had no option because uh, I was uh, uh, being targeted uh, by the uh, military regime mm -hmm. down there, so it wasn't good. And wh but why uh, Canada? Did you have other options or, or why well, was it Canada? Well, uh, uh, first I contacted my two key professors abroad. Richardson, Dennis Richardson at the Imperial College and Herb Kellogg at uh, Columbia University. And, uh, and as a result of what they did, I did get an invitation to join INCO. There were um, uh, former uh, uh, classmates, uh, lab uh, mates uh, from the two universities working for INCO. The vice president of uh, research and development at INCO was a former student of Herr Kellogg, and he had a very good relationship uh, with uh, Herb, Dr. Charlie O'Neill. And uh, the, the, the section head of pyrometallurgy at um, the INCO Research Lab uh, had been uh, uh, very close to me at the Imperial College. We developed a very good relationship. Um, so uh, when they heard my name and they knew what was the situation situation <laughs> in Chile. Yeah. They said, come. And I came okay. with the entire family. But it sounds simple today, but yeah. <laughs> it wasn't that simple at that time. That easy. Mm -hmm. It so, wasn't that easy. So what was your first impression of Canada of, uh, and of your job at INCO? Uh, well, uh, uh, in, in, in one respect, I felt very comfortable because I knew uh, a number of people and they did their utmost uh, to make me feel at home. Mm -hmm. But uh, on the other hand, I would strongly miss my... Uh, 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 Chilean activities, you know, and, uh, and uh, uh, at, at home we would uh, discuss this situation with 
my wife, uh, uh, the children, uh, when we came uh, here, we were already grown up uh, children. Uh, our uh, oldest uh, daughter was uh, uh, 17. Okay, she's ready for university. Uh, uh, yes, and, uh, and the youngest was uh, four. Uh, and uh, because they went with us to the UK when I did my uh, PhD at the Imperial College, they went to school there. So their English was even better than mine. Okay. <laughs> you know? So it was relatively easy for them uh, to integrate uh, to their new environment uh, very rapidly. They made uh, new uh, friends, uh, but in 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 my case, the ghost of the past would come to visit me quite frequently in the first period here in Canada. You know, I would be in a meeting and, and I would look around and I would say, "What am I doing?" Here, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, and and as I said, this was a subject of conversation with my wife, uh, who incidentally had been in Chile, mostly a housewife, although uh, later in life down there she entered university and she graduated in political sciences so but she had never worked so I, I, I would tell her you are past in Chile it's not <laughs> like like mine despite the fact that she did participate in a number of activities uh, relating to uh, the university, um, but uh, her, her uh, work activities started here in Canada. The first thing she did was to enter Sheridan College, and she said, I'm going to take social working. And she graduated in two years and That's she started to work. So her life away from home started here. It was a different type of, 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 of situation. Anyways, back to my second... <laughs> Your second beginning. <laughs> my second beginning. Uh, uh, after two years uh, in, in, in the process engineering group uh, here in uh, the Toronto office, which was located in one of those black towers uh, of the TV bank, uh, one day I was told, we need you at the lab. We have to replace the section head there of pyrometallurgy this is going to be your new job. So I moved to the lab and, uh, and uh, then I was deeply involved in research. The Pyro group was, was a big group. Uh, we were about uh, 15 people uh, in between uh, uh, research uh, engineers or research scientists uh, and technicians and uh, and uh, we had uh, quite a number of projects uh, it, it was busy but it was fun for me it was fun so I never completely forgot about uh, Chile but uh, but uh, I was fully satisfied uh, with uh, a, a new career uh, in, in industrial research. At that time, we used to 
parcel out uh, more fundamental work to universities. So I started to get in touch with Canadian universities um, and, uh, uh, and that was practically not exactly from coast to coast uh, because in the east uh, there is not much going on in extractive uh, metallurgy, but, uh, but I had the opportunity to meet uh, people from McGill, all of the Ontario universities, and uh, the University of British uh, Columbia. We started a major project with the University of British Columbia, and at that time the key man there was uh, Keith Brimacombe, uh, who was a fellow who had a fantastic uh, career, academic career. Um, uh, he obtained the Order of Canada because of the work uh, he was doing mainly for the uh, steel industry. Um, and Keith uh, had been at the Imperial College at the same time that I was there. So we had a relationship uh, on top of which we could build up an even stronger relationship uh, here. Um, and at the University of Toronto, we started to do work with uh, Jim Toguri first, uh, and then Thorstein Utiger. And uh, you know, because of the paper yesterday that um, uh, uh, my relationship with uh, Thorstein was very profound. And I'm going to come back to that when we talk about uh, mentorship. Um, uh, so, this was a completely new world. And, uh, and Dr. O'Neill gave me all the space and freedom that uh, I would need uh, to start uh, new activities, not necessarily directly relating to the research work that we were doing in the Pyro Group. Um, and uh, I, 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 I started to talk to him about the possibility of developing a stronger relations with the copper uh, industry in Chile. He said, go ahead, go ahead. And uh, that was how the copper conference started. Yes, you're known to be the, uh, uh, the, the founder of that. Uh, uh, one of them. One of them. One of them. Yes. <laughs> and, and this must have been after the regime was over. And uh, no. No? Not necessarily, Will. Okay. No, I started to travel to Chile. Uh, I, re I remember my first trip there, which was three years after we settled here in Canada. And, uh, and uh, the director of the group of process engineering, a beautiful man, Dan Kelly, um, it told me, Carlos, if you don't feel comfortable, don't go. But maybe the single most important incentive was to see my mother will. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask your parents. Yes. My father died okay. before we came to Canada. But in Chile, my mother, my brothers, Siblings. I am the oldest in, in a family of five. Uh, four boys, one girl. <laughs> uh, uh, poor, poor mom. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> and, 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 uh, so that was the single strongest incentive. But it was okay. It was okay. They went in, came out. No problems? No problems. 
No problems. They had, no problems. They had forgotten about you or uh, uh, well, the, the government? I, I, I'm not too sure about that. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I was never, uh, I was never uh, deeply involved in politics, you know. And uh, and as I explained to Anna, uh, as a university student. Um, most of the students were center left or or left, you know, and the, and the two main groups were uh, uh, students who uh, used to belong or sympathizers of uh, Marxist-oriented uh, socialist uh, parties. There was a very active uh, Communist Party in, in, in Chile. And the other important group was uh, uh, the uh, uh, Christian leftist-oriented uh, uh, students. And there were some important leaders in the country, including uh, 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 one or two bishops who would support, you know, that kind of uh, of, uh, of of development. Uh, I was in that uh, uh, group, uh, uh, but uh, that, but anyways, uh, 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 I I do remember uh, a, a good friend. Um, uh, a mining engineer who came to visit us two days after the military coup. And, and before uh, going into the university to study mining engineer, he had been in the Navy Academy uh, and, 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 and he had quit. Uh, and, and he told me, I know these people. I know these people. First is going to be the Marxist. Then it's going to be just all of the uh, members of uh, political movements. And then it's going to be everybody who thinks independently. <laughs> Academics. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, so uh, I guess I was because I, 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 I never was too deeply involved in, in politics. But uh, during the government of President Allende, uh, um, I gave some uh, uh, consulting, uh, honorary consulting, uh, to two ministers of mine who had been uh, students of mine. And, uh, and uh, I also uh, gave the consulting uh, to uh, the uh, vice president of operations of uh, the state-owned uh, copper company in Chile, Codelco. Um, and the other big sin <laughs> was protecting some Argentinian academics who had run away from another military dictatorship uh, in Argentina. Oh. And, uh, and, um, uh, uh, during the during the regime of uh, General Onganía mm -hmm. in Argentina, the police went into the faculty of sciences and uh, and just took all of these wow. people, you know, uh, out and they beat them and uh, and uh, and the rector of the university, the same historian, still. 
who started this uh, uh, expansion of, uh, of my faculty, he immediately offered uh, asylum to these yeah. academics. They came to Chile and um, and uh, but, but late in the late uh, 60s, I guess, uh, 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 the militaries were already a little bit upset with the presence of these people in 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 Chile, and uh, they finally accused a group of them of mingling uh, into the political life of uh, the, the 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 university, and they were expelled. They were expelled during the vacation period, and uh, at that time I was director of the School of Engineering, and uh, with uh, two colleagues from the faculty, uh, we went to see uh, the Ministry of the Interior, uh, we went to see um, uh, uh, the President of the Christian Democratic Party, we went to see the Ministry of Education to advocate for these people, but uh, but they were expelled. But um, uh, I always told the uh, friends and um, uh, the family, probably at that time my name was entered mm -hmm. into into the book of, uh, of uh, the uh, uh, badly behaved uh, people, you the know. The naughty list. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So, anyways, going back to the story I was telling you about, I started to travel to Chile, and, uh, and, um, and uh, we established a, a good relationship uh, with uh, the copper smelters in Chile, uh, uh, we started to talk about exchanging technology between uh, um, Codelco and Inco. Uh, uh, incidentally, most of the people I was talking to had been my students yes. as, at the time. So uh, 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 all of this was very simple you know, to, to, to organize. And uh, just as an example, uh, uh, Will, uh, uh, Inco at that time in the Copper Cliff smelter uh, had two big problems. One was SO2 emissions mm -hmm. and the other one was energy consumption. They were using the old uh, reverberatory furnaces, and, uh, and, uh, and at the El Teniente Smelte in Chile, they had developed oxy fuel burners coming through the roof of the furnace, and they had been successful in reducing the amount of energy required to smelt a ton of concentrate dramatically. They allowed us to use that technology mm -hmm. in copper cliff. And, uh, and for a number of years, there were a couple of furnaces reverse furnaces in, 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 in Copper Cliff using oxy fuel burners mounted in the roof of the furnace. And even more, this technology was later used by Noranda at the Horn smelter. So this is an important example, you know, of the kind of exchange uh, and uh, uh, the, that uh, that uh, we had uh, with Codelco, um, uh, we wanted to sell them the Inco flash smelting technology. But they had developed uh, their, their own technology and, um, uh, and they are still using 
their their own uh, so-called teniente converter uh, technology to do most of the smelting of uh, uh, copper concentrates. It, it's, it's, it's a problem they have. It's a problem they have because in, in, in the development of the copper industry in Chile, they have neglected the smelters. And little by little, the amount of copper crossing the Pacific Ocean as concentrate rather than copper, never mind refined copper, has been increasing. And, and China today has a tremendous capacity to do smelting of copper concentrates. Personally, I think is not a good policy. But uh, eventually the Chinese are going to say, now we are in a very good position to tell them, look, will continue smelting your concentrates, but the fees for smelting and refining will go up. Mm -hmm. Anyways, uh, uh, as I said, I think, I think that that was an important aspect of, uh, of, of the work that I did uh, um, a section head of pyrometallurgy, not directly related to the research work that we were doing there. And, 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 and another aspect which um, was not directly relating to that research work was the selling of the Inco flash smelting technology in the southwest of the USA. Yeah. Uh, 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 Big they, business there too. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And, and we managed to sell that technology to two smelters. And in one of them, the Inco flash furnace still operated. So, I guess that covers part two of. Part two? Of, 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 of my career, but we are going to come back to that uh, when we talk about um, uh, uh, mentoring and... Um, yes. Uh, just before we get into that, uh, you did also, uh, you haven't mentioned any of your work with U of T because you started working for the university as well, right? Uh, uh, that's that's correct. As I was professor. going. I, I, was, I was going to. I was going to go into it. You know, okay. uh, uh, as as uh, part three of oh, part three. Sorry. Uh, yes. Know, yes. <laughs> despite <laughs> the fact that, that that my relationships uh, with uh, universities. Um, from UVC to um, uh, McGill mm -hmm. and. Um, uh, uh, the, the U of T uh, and other uh, universities uh, had started uh, while working uh, full-time at the INCO research lab. Uh, in, in, in a few opportunities, I was invited to give uh, lectures. Um, and I did that. Uh, it was uh, it was a lot of uh, fun to do that and uh, uh, get in touch uh, with uh, university students. So when when I had to uh, 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 stop working uh, for Inco, when I had to retire, and um, uh, I have to mention that at that time there was here in the province of Ontario mandatory retirement at age 65. Uh, so in 1997 my time was up. <laughs> was up. But no one in this business actually retires. That's what I learned. <laughs> uh, and but I continued consulting mm -hmm. uh, uh, for INCO uh, 
until very recently. Uh, and uh, and uh, and we did uh, we did uh, we did a lot of uh, of, uh, of 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 work. Uh, uh, let me mention this as an example. Uh, for a long time, most of the research work, and I'm going to start talking about also the the the. Uh, shrinking of uh, yes, research uh, in-house research in industry uh, uh, by by discussing uh, 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 these uh, these examples. Uh, well, uh, uh, most of the work we did at the Incolab was in support of expansion of nickel producing operations. Uh, when, when, when I joined the INCO, um, uh, the company uh, had already commissioned uh, the Soraco smelter in Indonesia. So the 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 nature of nickel production within Inco was changing because it had been mainly nickel from sulfide ores, which are amenable to concentration by milling. The ore in the Sudbury Basin, uh, very round numbers, you know, uh, consist of um, uh, 1% nickel, 1% copper, and some uh, cobalt. Uh, uh, the, the ratio of nickel to cobalt is about 30, and uh, precious metals. But those ores are amenable to concentration by milling. So the ore was taken to uh, uh, the mill, crash, ground, uh, floated, and you would end up with a concentrate which a long time was increasing based on research that was going on at the Incolab from about 6, 7 percent nickel to 12, 13, for even 15 percent nickel, which is quite a change because uh, 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 that uh, means that uh, the amount of energy that you need uh, to smelt uh, one ton of concentrate uh, per unit weight of nickel goes down quite dramatically. Uh, 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 but uh, 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 now Inco was starting to produce nickel from laterites, and laterites are not amenable. <laughs> uh, I do this for the second time. It's, it's uh, okay. You talk with your hands, like me. <laughs> and 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 laterites. Oh, it's because there you go. It's because uh, you're uh, okay. Yeah, it's because you were sitting on it. I was pulling. Okay. And, and, and laterites are not amenable to concentration by milling. So you have to smell it. All of the ore that you take from the ground, a completely different game. And, and, the, and the, the process that was used in Indonesia was a process who was entirely developed within the lab and the, the, the process research stations that the company used to operate in Port Colwell. And, and I come now to the point of 
the amount of work that the company was doing in an R and D. Mm -hmm. uh, when when I joined Inco at the lab, we were about a hundred and twenty people in the various sections uh, of R and D. Uh, 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 right, right. Uh, analytical uh, labs, uh, 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 the library, uh, information services, and you name it. And there was about the same amount of people at what we used to call the research stations in Port Colborne, which were plants in which we would do pilot plant test work. So at the lab, it was mainly bench scale. At the research stations, was a much larger scale. We would work with tons of material, you know. Uh, but we at the lab would be responsible for designing the pilot plant work which would be done at the research stations. At the research stations, there would be very skillful uh, operators uh, to do the work. Uh, uh, but we at the lab would be responsible for planning the work, making sure that the objectives of the work uh, were uh, accomplished. Uh, um, so it was very, very exciting, uh, Will. Uh, we had uh, a lot of toys to play with. That always helps. <laughs> right, right. So I would travel to Port Colborne every so often. And I do have stories about driving in the middle of, uh, of a blizzard, <laughs> for instance, <laughs> because it, it, it's amazing that once you cross the the Niagara Escarpment to the other side towards going to Lake Erie. The climate is very, 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 very different. Yeah, it's a, a bit harsher. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, uh, anyways, so it was a big group of people with uh, with. Uh, a fantastic facilities to do all of this work, as I said, relating to the expansion of uh, the company's uh, nickel uh, production and relating to, in the case of Canada, to doing uh, or looking uh, for alternatives uh, to help uh, the company to meet uh, the government uh, emission uh, regulations, which were more and more strict, you know, along the years. Um, there was no time, you know, to move uh, our brains uh, to other areas. You would discuss technical things uh, in the corridors of the building, uh, in the washrooms, and, um, uh, but that was our life. It was different from the university in the sense that there was a clear end of the work day mm -hmm. and family life would, would start. So children were happier, my wife was uh, much uh, happier uh, too. Well, all of that came to an end in 1997 when I retired. 
Why? Because of age. You had As to. I told you, yeah, you I had, had to. to. <laughs> I had to. Everybody had to retire at the, at the age uh, 65. There was True. no alternative. But I continued working as a consultant. And among other things, I organized test work which took place in Chile at a pilot plant that uh, Codelco had adjacent to the Chuki Kamate smelter because one of the things Inco was interested in was in the possibility of doing continuous converting in the Sadbury smelter. You know, one of the problems there, and I don't know how familiar are you with the <laughs> the process uh, 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 in cooperative, uh, that you take the concentrate, you put the concentrate in the flash furnace, and you make a mat, you oxidize in, 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 in the furnace most of the iron and the sulfur uh, in the concentrate, uh, the iron oxides form slag, mm -hmm. and uh, you concentrate the nickel, the copper, the cobalt, and the precious metals in a mat, which is still not final product. There is still iron, lots of sulfur in, in, in that material. Uh, 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 so you take the mat to the converters. And in the converters, you finish oxidizing the iron and part of the sulfur to make a, a, a nickel copper sulfur material, which then undergoes uh, some other stages, including milling, to separate the nickel from the copper. And, uh, but this converting is done in uh, uh, <coughs> vessels which operate uh, in cycles. It's not a continuous process. So the gas streams that you generate, you know, are not really the kind of gas streams that you need uh, to. Um, um, quite uh, feed uh, an acid plant, um, a low concentration of the SO2 because in these converters there is a lot of infiltration of air and whatever. Con in continuous converting, you would generate a continuous stream of gas with a higher concentration of SO2, it would be much easier to put that gas through an acid plant to make sulfuric acid and reduce the SO2 emissions. So continuous converting was like uh, an important mm -hmm. goal. And, uh, and uh, we did that work in Chile because, and I come back to the point of, uh, of uh, shrinking of uh, in-house research. At that time, the pilot plants in Port Colorado had been shut down. That happened before I retired. So there was already some movement in the direction, you know, that uh, this kind of work represented an expenditure uh, which was not quite justified according to the leaders of the company. And that was the reason why we went to Chile to do that.
But that gave me an opportunity to do an important piece of work uh, on behalf of INCO after retirement. Uh, and, and at the same time, uh, Will, uh, because I had more time available in my hands and, uh, and uh, based on conversations uh, which I had maintained uh, with uh, former students uh, down there, um, I decided to spend longer times in Chile to reactivate uh, my former department of mining and extractive uh, metallurgy. Uh, so but for a... Uh, we were able to get the substantial uh, financial support uh, from the mining industry in Chile to establish uh, industrial shares. Uh, we ended up with something like 10 shares in mining, mineral processing, uh, extractive uh, metallurgy. Uh, something that you would never see happening here in Canada. And, and we came, you know, to the question of uh, uh, industry support uh, for academic activities in these fields in universities, which I think are sine qua non. Because for the University of Toronto, having mining or extracting metallurgy okay so um after this interruption we're gonna keep going with uh you were just about to discuss the uh shrinking of um industrial in-house uh, research which also leads to shrinking also in the academic world right uh, right research in the academic world so could you elaborate on that right uh, uh, well, uh, the, the key point here, when you look at uh, the uh, uh, development of new technology and also at the development of uh, uh, people, young people with uh, the capability to do innovative work in the field of technology uh, in, in industry uh, is related to... So we were just about to ta start talking about the shrinking of industrial in-house research yes, and how that also yes, leads to the shrinking yes, of research yes, yes. in the academic uh, world. Uh, uh, may, may, maybe I should start by saying that in the last few years, if I look at uh, my former employer, INCO Today Valley, mm -hmm. and it was a loss for Canada in the sense that INCO was an important Canadian, truly Canadian mining industry, acquired by a Brazilian, mainly iron ore producer, that wanted to expand in the field of nickel. The new owner apparently thinks that uh, what INCO had in terms of technology is the technology that they need to continue operating for the next uh, few decades. And the last 
time, first with the recession uh, that started in 2008, uh, and with this new situation we are living today, uh, the contraction of uh, the um, uh, Chinese economy, that was the main consumer of uh, basic uh, materials. Um, the mining industry here in Canada, in the hands uh, of foreign owners, they think that um, they have to reduce costs to the bone and there is no sense in spending more money in the development of technology that they don't need. That's, that's the feeling. Um, the, we saw the closure of um, the, the uh, Noranda Research Center mm. in Point Claire. Um, that happened in the early 2000s, uh, and maybe even a little earlier. And now the INCO, the former INCO research lab here at Sheridan Park uh, has been reduced to a core group of people. I understand that they are 30 um, and um, they call it the Valley Technology Excellence uh, Center uh, to assist the operations, but there is no research work as such going on. No innovation. No innovation. No innovation. And um, my personal feeling is that uh, 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 the people leading the industry today think that uh, what they need is to just use the tools of industrial type of engineering, uh, modify uh, ways of operating, uh, reducing people, uh, uh, to uh, go through these difficult times uh, for the industry. But the, 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 the main uh, uh, problem is that uh, they lose young people and in universities nobody would think in getting into these fields because they don't see the possibility of having a good uh, career mm -hmm. opportunity. A lot less options now. Right. And there's probably less um, partnerships as well with universities. Oh, absolutely, nowadays, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. It, 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 I can go back, uh, uh, Will, to the operation of uh, this uh, center for process chemical metallurgy that um, Professor McLean uh, referred to on his presentation uh, about the history of the Department of Material Science and Engineering at the University of uh, Toronto. Uh, this was a joint uh, industry university uh, venture um, and um, the director of the center, uh, Rolly Bergman, uh, from mm -hmm. the mid 80s to I would say 1997 and later myself, um, uh, would, we, we would play the role of uh, Robin Hood, uh, uh, putting our hands in the pockets of industry, raising a fund to uh, finance uh, research projects and um, uh, 
handing these uh, money to uh, professors uh, who would compete by presenting uh, research uh, projects uh, to the board of directors of uh, the CCPM. Um, so the director would do lobbying with industry, mm -hmm. uh, trying to get um, uh, more industry members uh, sitting at the table, you know, um, and um, uh, but it, it, it was a little bit of a struggle. Um, when the center started, the steel industry, Dofasco, Stelco, were important players, but they had already quit at the time that I took over from uh, Rory as uh, director of, uh, of, uh, of the center. Um, uh, the main players were Inco, Falconbridge, Catch the engineering firm. Um, uh, uh, we had uh, some other minor players, but uh, uh, basically we would uh, raise about uh, one hundred thousand dollars per year uh, to distribute among professors uh, working mainly in the Ontario universities. Um, so, um, uh, of course, uh, the U of T was uh, an important one, uh, Queens, uh, uh, Wealth, uh, 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 Waterloo uh, uh, would be uh, the key universities uh, presenting uh, uh, projects. There would be an annual competition, and, and a, a, a very, well, there were two very important things. First, we had an agreement with ENSER. So the projects that we would support would get additional money mm -hmm. from ENSER dollar for dollar. So and, and, and the second agreement was, the, was with the university itself because they would not charge to those projects overhead, university overhead. So one dollar coming from industry would be multiplied by a factor of uh, three practically. And most of that money was used uh, to uh, uh, support uh, uh, PhD students. Um, so it was a very, very successful way of um, uh, supporting uh, 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 mineral processing extractive metallurgy in uh, university. But in the mid of the first decade of the current century, or millennium if yes. you want, <laughs> in which case, uh, uh, yes, yeah, still mid-decade, um, we started to see that uh, our industrial partners were having second thoughts about continuing their support of, uh, of this uh, center. And uh, by 2010, we had to fold the tent. Mm. It's, um, it's ironic, too, because initially most of what R&D would do is in the long run often cut, cut costs, come up with brand new technologies to save money, time. That's true. Um, that's, know, that's true. But, uh, but, uh, but the thinking is that 
the technology which is already available, you know, is, is good enough. Good enough. No, yeah, like anything, it, it's good enough for a while, but not forever. I agree. We'll we'll finish with the uh, with uh, one last topic, which is the uh, the impact of mentoring um, in developing uh, innovative professionals for the industry, whether it's in Canada or in, in Chile, which you've worked a lot. Well, well I, I, I think that that's a very very important uh, uh, topic, and um, along my academic, uh, industrial, uh, academic again <laughs> life, uh, I, I have kept this need for mentoring very very present in my mind. I'm going to give you uh, examples from Chile and Canada in this particular regard. Um, in the case of Chile, um, after I went back to Chile from Columbia University, uh, we started to work on a, a much more stable relationship uh, with uh, Columbia University. And we ended up with a program in which we would send students who had completed three of the six year engineering program at the University of Chile to Colombia to undertake a master's program under the supervision of one of the professors in the department of either mining or extractive metallurgy at Colombia. And, uh, and uh, we got uh, uh, money from uh, the uh, uh, American companies operating in Chile to support uh, that uh, program. And uh, we started to send two students per year to Colombia. We did that, I would say, for about six or seven years. And, uh, and uh, interestingly, uh, uh, the students, after completing their master's uh, program at Columbia University, with the sole requisite of translating their master thesis to Spanish, would automatically receive the, uh, the uh, a diploma of uh, uh, mining or extractive metallurgical engineers from the University of Chile. And uh, it was a very successful program, uh, Will. Um, I had the responsibility of selecting the students. And uh, um, most of them returned uh, to Chile. There were maybe a couple who stayed in the USA. Uh, and, uh, and they had uh, excellent careers in industry. And they've made very substantial contributions to the development of the copper industry in Chile. Um, as an anecdote, one of them took mining economics at Colombia, went back to Chile, and um, he started to uh, expand uh, his uh, interest in uh, economics in general 
and to, to uh, uh, my surprise, um, during the military regime, he ended up in very important positions and finally as Minister of Finance. Wow. Under Pinochet. Under Pinochet. Wow. Yes. Moreover, when Pinochet had to allow uh, the political parties uh, in Chile, you know, to operate uh, freely and um, the elections uh, started to take place, in the first presidential election, this fellow was the candidate of the supporters of Pinochet for the position of president. Wow. So in, in, in this particular uh, case, I, I, I wasn't uh, too extremely happy. No, you know? yeah, no kidding. <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> very, very intelligent, very intelligent uh, individual. Yeah. Yes, yes. But that's an example, you know, uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the programs which uh, 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 would represent uh, interesting possibilities of, of, uh, of uh, 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 mentoring people to uh, finally end up as uh, innovative uh, professionals uh, uh, and, uh, and end up making uh, important uh, contributions to, uh, to industry. Mm -hmm. There are a number of them who are still very active in Chile. Why not? I am still active here. They are younger than me, you know? Yeah, they have no so, excuse. So, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, now, here at INCO, uh, because of the space that I was given, you know, to uh, uh, operate uh, within the company, um, uh, three of the members of the Pyro Metallurgy Group did uh, their PhDs. Um, while I was uh, section head of pyrometallurgy and, and uh, they kept on working for INCO and uh, let me see, in, in, in two, in, in the three cases, uh, they did the research work, the experimental work necessary to write their PhD thesis in the labs. And of course, the topics were topics of interest for us. I'm going to give you just one example. Uh, 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 one of them, um, uh, he worked under the supervision of uh, a professor of the Department of uh, Chemical Engineering at McMaster, Professor Malcolm Baird. And uh, he built up a plastic model of the Inco flash furnace to study the fluodynamics of uh, mainly the gas streams within the furnace. Uh, the other two did their work under the supervision of professors at the U of T. One worked uh, with uh, uh, Jim Toguri and he did fundamental work on the thermodynamic properties of uh, the nickel mats. And uh, the other one did his PhD under the supervision of Thorstein Utigar. And, uh, and uh, this work was also relating to uh, uh, 
possible new ways of operating, operating the Inco furnace to decrease the nickel content in the slacks. Um, they all succeeded. I think uh, the company did uh, well by uh, allowing these people to continue developing uh, you know, while still uh, uh, working. Um, I think that's another possibility of, uh, of uh, doing uh, good uh, mentoring uh, work. And, uh, and finally, what uh, you've done both, you've done academic and you've done industry, and that's in this line of work, it's... Uh, Your attention, please. The fire alarm testing is now complete. We apologize for the inconvenience this may have caused. Thank you. Okay, so let me try again. Finally, <laughs> there we go. So finally, um, in in this line of work, there's often, or at least people I interview, there's often the academic world and the industry world. You've done both. Uh, if you had to choose, which looking back, is there one specific that you that you prefer? That's that's closer to your heart than uh, than the other. Well, I I, I think that what is closer to my heart uh, will is uh, is developing people um, uh, establishing uh, with these people a good uh, friendship and enjoying that uh, later in life uh, seeing them uh, succeed uh, making contributions uh, you know and i do have the Tremendous benefit of uh, of uh, of enjoying uh, their friendship, and you can do that uh, at both. university or 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 within industry, an industry with a a, a, a mind uh, which uh, would let them uh, understand, you know, that this is. Important is for the benefit of the mm -hmm. business success of them. Well, uh, Carlos Diaz, uh, muchas gracias. No um, hay de qué will. <laughs> is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, uh, well, the only thing I would like to uh, to to add, uh, Will, is that um, uh, I I I think uh, that uh, this project in which uh, you are deeply involved uh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic project uh, it was time uh, and, uh, and uh, I have to thank another good friend Sam Marcusen you know to have uh, taken uh, the leadership of uh, finally doing it mm -hmm. I think that this is going to be uh, a fantastic uh, 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 I would say a deposit of experience uh, which is going to be available to many generations. Uh, Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, thank you for your time. A pleasure. <laughs>